Look closely at an airplane and you'll see it's covered in spikes, tubes, fins and little lumps. They look random, but every single one has a purpose, often learned the hard way through aviation history. Today on Fact Drop 5, five of the strangest things sticking out of airplanes and why engineers put them there. Number 1. Static wicks. Those slender black sticks you see trailing off the wings and tailplanes, they're static discharge wicks. Made from conductive composites and carbon fibers, they bleed off thousands of volts of static electricity safely into the atmosphere. Without them, radio static would overwhelm communications. While static wicks don't stop lightning, they help dissipate the residual charge after a strike. Airliners get struck by lightning fairly often, about once per year per aircraft on average. Despite how dramatic it sounds, lightning strikes almost never cause accidents. Aircraft are designed with conductive skin and bonding systems, so the current flows safely across the fuselage and exits, usually at wingtips or tail, without harming passengers or systems. Most strikes only leave minor scorch marks. The Airbus A380, the world's largest passenger jet, carries over 50 static wicks spread across its wings, tailplanes and rudder. Each one can dissipate around 50,000 volts per inch of wick length. The A380 has the largest wing ever put on a passenger aircraft, 80 meters tip to tip. Bigger surface area equals more friction with air molecules equals more static charge buildup. Unlike smaller jets with just one or two flaps per wing, the A380 has multiple flap segments, huge ailerons, spoilers that double as speed brakes. Each moving control surface must have its own static wicks because hinge lines interrupt the flow of static electricity. It carries an immense amount of electronics, from quadruple redundant flight computers to dozens of passenger entertainment systems. More static equals higher risk of interference. With wicks distributed across every trailing surface, the static is released evenly and kept away from sensitive avionics and comms equipment. Maintenance. They're relatively cheap, but absolutely essential. During pre-flight walkarounds, pilots often check that wicks are intact, because without enough of them, communication quality degrades. Number 2. Pitot tubes. Those little forward-facing probes on the nose? Pitot tubes. They measure airspeed by comparing air pressure in the tube with the static air outside. They look simple, but they're critical. The Pitot tube was invented by French engineer Henri Pitot in the 1700s to measure the flow velocity of water in the Seine River. Pitot's idea was to insert a tube facing into the fluid flow. The fluid would rise inside it to a height proportional to the velocity head. This principle was later adapted to measure airspeed by relating dynamic pressure caused by motion to static or ambient pressure. Just a few years after the Wright brothers, aviation pioneers started using crude pitot tubes linked to manometers to gauge airspeed. These were often glass tubes with liquid columns mounted externally. During the interwar period, airspeed indicators evolved into cockpit instruments. The pitot tube was paired with a static vent, giving ambient pressure, producing the differential pressure needed for accurate readings. The result? The familiar pitot static system, which underpins not only airspeed indicators, but also altimeters and vertical speed indicators. In World War II, aircraft flew faster and higher, so pitot tubes had to be heated to prevent icing, which could block airflow and give false readings. From the 1950s onward, pitot tubes became more refined, rugged, electrically heated, with multiple ports to sense total and static pressure more accurately. Today, almost every aircraft from a Cessna 152 to an Airbus A380 relies on pitot tubes. They feed air data computers that calculate indicated airspeed and Mach number. Let's look at a Boeing 777's pitot tubes, since they're a classic example of how redundancy and heating are engineered into modern airliners. Length. Each probe sticks out about 15 to 20 centimeters from the nose. Diameter of opening, typically 5 to 6 millimeters. A standard 777 has six pitot probes, two primary on the captain's side, two primary on the first officer's side, two redundant sensors for standby instruments and systems. They're mounted on either side of the nose, slightly ahead of the cockpit windows to catch undisturbed airflow. 
Each Pitot probe has electric heating elements built into the metal body. On the 777, they can reach up to around 200 degrees Celsius, hot enough to stay ice-free even at minus 50 degrees in cruise. Heat is applied automatically when the engines are running, but pilots can manually check or test them. All six Pitot probes feed into three independent air data computers. If one probe disagrees, the system cross-checks with the others and rejects the faulty input. The design is constantly monitored and Pitot probes are among the most frequently inspected components during walkarounds. Number 3. Angle of attack vanes. Near the nose, you'll often spot small paddle-like flaps. These are angle of attack vanes. Each vane swings freely like a tiny weather vane. They continuously measure the angle between the wing's cord line and the relative airflow. That data is fed into the Air Data Inertial Reference Units, ADIRUS, and the flight control computers, which then trigger stall warnings, adjust fly-by-wire protections like alpha floor protection, help the aircraft calculate safe climb, descent, and landing profiles. The very first production aircraft to feature an AOA vane was the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress in the 1930s as part of its stall warning system. Since then, every major jet from Embraer's to Airbus A320s carries several, often electrically heated to prevent freezing. The A380 has eight AOA vanes in total. They're mounted in pairs along the forward fuselage near the cockpit windows, on both the left and right sides. Placement is carefully chosen so they sit in clean airflow, undisturbed by the nose or cockpit structures. Number 4. VHF and HF antennas. Those shark fin bumps and wire-like projections on the fuselage? They're antennas. The very first aircraft with a VHF antenna was the Douglas DC-3 in the late 1930s, when aviation shifted from AM to FM radio. For long-range HF, early jets like the Boeing 707 and the Douglas DC-8 carried trailing wire antennas that literally unspooled from the fuselage like fishing lines. Today, modern aircraft like the Airbus A350 carry blade-style VHF antennas under the fuselage and large fairings on top for satellite internet. Without them, aircraft couldn't talk to ATC across continents, oceans or polar routes. The A380 is packed with antennas due to its size, range and passenger systems. VHF antennas for short-range ATC comms, around 8, spread under the belly and on top. HF antennas, long-range comms, two, one dorsal, one ventral. GPS antennas, four, mounted on top of the fuselage. Weather radar antenna, one, large dish in the nose radome. DME, distance measuring equipment, two to four. TCAS, traffic collision avoidance system, two, top and bottom of fuselage. Marker beacon antennas, two, usually on the belly. SATCOM or Wi-Fi domes, at least two large fairings. The big humps on top. ELT, Emergency Locator Transmitter, 1 to 2 small whip antennas. Total around 25 to 30 antennas on a typical A380. The A380 is huge, 73 meters long, 24 meters tall, and with a wing wider than a football field. On smaller jets, A320, 737, two GPS antennas on top of the fuselage are enough because the sky is always visible. On the A380, parts of the aircraft itself can block satellite signals, especially the massive tail fin. Multiple antennas, front and rear fuselage, prevent blind spots. Number 5. Drain Masts Look under the belly of an Airbus A320 or a Boeing 777 and you'll spot small tube-like projections called drain masts. They don't look like much, but they quietly handle one of aviation's less glamorous problems, where to put all the liquid waste an aircraft generates. Aircraft constantly produce condensation from air conditioning packs, moisture from galleys and lavatories, and even trace amounts of fuel from engine systems. If these fluids were simply allowed to seep out randomly, they could streak along the fuselage, freeze at altitude, or corrode sensitive surfaces. Drain masts solve this by channeling liquid to specific outlets and ejecting it cleanly into the slipstream where it disperses harmlessly. Each drain mast is electrically heated, maintaining temperatures above freezing even when the outside air is minus 50 degrees Celsius. This prevents dangerous icicles from forming and breaking loose mid-flight.
Modern wide bodies like the Boeing 777 carry around a dozen drain masts, strategically placed beneath galleys, lavatories and system bays. Narrow bodies like the Airbus A320 usually have fewer, but the principle is the same. The idea dates back to the Douglas DC-4 in the 1940s, which was the first aircraft designed with dedicated drain masts. Before that, early airliners often landed with unsightly frozen streaks of fuel or water down their fuselages. By concentrating the outflow through heated masts, engineers made aircraft cleaner, safer and less prone to corrosion. Dimensions of drain masts Length, typically 15 to 30 centimeters, projecting from the fuselage. Diameter, about 3 to 5 centimeters, tapering at the outlet for smooth airflow. Heating, internal electric elements keep the mast between 20 to 50 degrees Celsius to prevent ice accretion, even when outside air is minus 50 degrees Celsius at cruise. They're fairly small, was about the size of a large marker or short flashlight, but are carefully fared so they don't create excess drag. Boeing 737, NG or MAX, typically has six to eight drain masts depending on configuration. Boeing 777 has roughly 10 to 12 drain masts spread under the belly, galley bays and near the APU area. Airbus A380, the heavyweight champion, carries 20 to 25 drain masts distributed along its double-deck fuselage. These handle multiple galleys and lavatories across two decks as well as extra air conditioning and fuel venting systems. Why so many on bigger jets? More passengers equals more galleys and lavatories. Each one needs its own overboard drain outlet. Bigger systems equals more condensation. Large jets like the A380 or 777 generate a surprising amount of moisture from pressurization and air conditioning packs. Redundancy. Multiple smaller masts are safer than one or two large drains because flow is distributed and less prone to clogging or icing. So the next time you see a plane bristling with odd spikes and tubes, remember, each one is there because of decades of engineering, safety and lessons learned from history. Which one surprised you most? Let us know in the comments and hit subscribe for more sharp surprising drops of knowledge here on Fact Drop 5.